I'd like to, to welcome you here to Darsbury Laboratory and to the SciTech Darsbury campus. Uh, my name is John Womersley. I'm the Chief Executive of STFC, the Science and Technology Facilities Council, who own and operate this laboratory uh, on behalf of the UK taxpayer. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you here um, to Big Data Day. I keep wanting to say Big Day Out, but no, Big <laughs> Data Day, uh, as part of the uh, International Festival of Business. Uh, we're very pleased to, to have such a, a, a large turnout here, representing very many uh, fields of business and, and, um, and industry. And we hope that you will find today interesting. Uh, STFC is a research council and we are the research council that's responsible for funding big science. And big science is no stranger to big data. The Large Hadron Collider at CERN, for example, where the Higgs boson was discovered last year, you may have heard um, about Peter Higgs and the discovery of the Higgs boson. The amount of data generated by the Large Hadron Collider is comparable to the data in Google's data store. Uh, and of course, all of that has to be analyzed and interpreted to extract the signal um, that, uh, that led to the Nobel Prize. Future projects, future big science projects, will place even more demands upon our ability to process data. Uh, Nigel Ricks, somewhere here, will, will be talking about the square kilometer array, or can tell you about the square kilometer array, next generation radio telescope project, which is to be constructed in South Africa and Australia. And the, the raw data coming out of SKA, out of uh, the hundreds of astronomy dishes that will be erected there, will be 10 times larger than the entire flow of data over the global internet today. So you think of all of the streaming video, all of the YouTube videos, all of the internet traffic, all of the email, all of the pornography circulating over the internet, SKA will generate 10 times more than that. And of course, computers to process that do not exist, and Moore's law will not deliver them by itself. Algorithms to process that magnitude of data and to extract the relatively small amounts of, of scientific signals that we want from it do not exist. So science data is one of the drivers of big data. Uh, but of course, it's by far from the only one. And, and we in STFC are well aware of the need to connect this kind of scientific technological capability with the demands of broader society and business. And one of our key missions through which, we, uh, which we're working in places like SciTech Darsbury is to make sure that there is a channel to connect the scientific uh, requirements which drive the technology development and the small businesses, the large businesses, the business challenges and economic and societal challenges which can benefit from it. And this afternoon, uh, you'll have a chance uh, to hear from our partners in IBM about some of the work that we're doing here at the Hartree Center across the road. In fact, you'll have an opportunity to tour the Hartree Center and see one of the UK's fastest supercomputers and learn about some of the things that we've done in partnership with stakeholders like Unilever in applying these kind of scientific capabilities to their industrial process uh, and reducing the time to market by factors of 10, for example. So both highly interesting scientific uh, demands and highly relevant economic application. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do here at places like SciTech Darsbury. So thank you for joining us. Um, a few housekeeping uh, remarks before we move on to the presentations. Uh, there are, like any good aircraft, two exits at the front and one at the rear. Uh, there is no fire alarm planned, so if you do hear an alarm, we will have to leave. The toilets are outside, uh, and uh, there is um, a. There will be filming, uh, so you know, be on your best behaviour because the uh, the the, the uh, proceedings will be filmed for for later uh, web streaming. And our team at the front will be tweeting. Uh, so, uh, so if the speakers say anything profoundly not uh, noteworthy, it will appear on the internet uh, with the hashtag, what is it, IFB14? Hashtag IFB2014, hashtag UK Big Data. And if any of you want to add to that Twitter stream, please go ahead. Um, anyway, so, so now let's move to the, the plenary uh, speakers. And we're pleased to have three plenary speakers here today who, who cover a broad range of application of data-intensive science, uh, starting um, with Phil Claridge. So let me introduce Phil. Uh, Phil rejoices in the title of Chief Innovation Architect, uh, which sounds like an interesting possibility, and uh, working with uh, JDSU. Over to you, Phil. Well, welcome. It's a pleasure talking to you and being your first speaker. I've been asked just to set uh, really out uh, the whole domain of big data and provide you some introductory slides, which you already, already know, so you could be giving the presentation for me. I'm going to come up with eight points, sort of talking points and thinking points for you. Let's see. 
as signposts. And then I'm going to come up with a couple of visions at the end, which are a couple of thought-provoking ideas for applications of big data, which you might try to pick up with. And I'm looking at the clock. I've told I've only got 12 minutes, and I can see my watch, so hopefully I won't overrun. <laughs> I'm an engineer, therefore no tie. Ask an engineer, <laughs> ask an engineer what big data is, and you'll get lots of complicated answers. It's more data that can fit on a big machine. Or, gee, you're going to give me some new toys to play with. Ask a business analyst, and uh, they'll talk to you all about the commercial opportunities and the legal concerns and some exciting things they can do with new and timely accurate information. I think there's actually just a very simple thing of what is big data. We've crossed a line where we can save everything. Where you are, what you're doing, everything that's coming out of census, everything can be saved. The IT has just crossed that line. It means we can ask some tremendous questions but actually there may be some significant consequences of keeping all of this data as well. Now, if people talk about big data as an introduction, the standard thing people say is they bring up a slide, I've borrowed this one from Intel, and everybody tells you how many tweets per minute and how many Flickr messages per minute and how much Facebook, and you can read it for yourself. While I think this is interesting, I think this actually understates what is big data, because this is big data which comes as a result of things that people know they're doing or that can be seen to be done. So that really corresponds to the left-hand column of the slide behind me. Traditional big data arises from things that people can relate to or processes that you can see. I'm listing here bank transactions and shop purchases and tweets, things that happen in the scientific arena and things that land up in government databases, of what, which is published, this is information that can actually be seen and, and people can relate to. What's interesting for me for the future of big data is big data that results as a result of machine-to-machine -machine interactions, where a few people may know what data is being collected, but you may not. <coughs> Clearly, there's automatic trading in the stock market, not many people may know what's happening there. The surveillance, uh, I live in Cambridge. There are more CCTV cameras in Cambridge than every other city in the UK. I don't know why. Maybe the students do bad things. Uh, smart energy, well, I did that in 1982 with a smart energy trial. Home sensors for the medical, we're coming in, CCTV. ANPR, uh, most of you may know that every, most bridges you pass under in the UK, your, your, your car registration plate's being snapshotted. We get to the Internet of Things, which I put in quote because I'm going to enjoy the session later to understand what that actually means. And now we come on to some interesting things, industrial sensors, and then they were personal sensors. We've got iWatch coming along, whatever that is, when Apple release it later this year, and we've got Google Glass, and we've got other devices in your pocket. We don't know what data they're actually collecting on us, but it's a huge stream of big data. I said I was going to do some signposts, and here... I'm really going to put this as eight key questions that when we embarked on some of our big data projects, we wish someone had tapped us on the shoulder and said, think about these eight things when you do big data. So I'll invite you to think about these eight things as you're through the sessions today. The first one is, if you want to get involved in this big data, please be clear why you're going to do it. Are you keeping deep data because it's data you must keep? It's stock trade information, it's medical records, or is it data you want to keep? <coughs> It uh, could be anything you buy at Tesco's, which they want to use for marketing research, every internet search they do, every URL you click. Please don't get into big data for the reason two or three Cambridge companies did recently, because it said, our oh, product manager says we need to do big data. Um, what should we do? And finally, big data will give you something you can ask questions of, but it's up to you to find the questions to ask of that data. No one's going to tap you on the shoulder. No arm's going to come out of the computer and say, out of all of this data, the questions you really need to ask, the insights you need to have are this. That's one of the hardest issues you're going to have to work yourself. Actually, the, real the proper title of this slide, before I begin to change it, is Big Data is Worthless. And it's actually true. Big data may have some commercial value if you can sell it, but big data isn't actionable. You've got to reduce it to a small amount of information. You may have millions of pieces of information about me, but if you talk to a marketeer who wants to launch a marketing campaign about me, you have to reduce that, I said to 50 here, or probably to five or 10 key measures, key pieces of information about me to allow you to target things. 
So all of the time with big data, you're saying, how can I get orders of magnitude reduction from this raw data to useful piece of information? And that reduction is not tens or hundreds. It's typically millions to one. Um, I list some numbers there. Um, I think one of the most interesting ones there, which I've got periphery involved in, is how do you take all the readings out from these industrial sensors and personal sensors and, and tell how things are going to go wrong? The third point is knowing your data. I've watched two or three big data projects where they've engaged tech consultants, they've engaged information scientists, and they haven't looked at the data they've got first. And the truth is, data broadly fits into two sorts. There's structured data, which is all about numbers and columns and spreadsheets and database tables. And there's unstructured data, documents, text, tweets. The technology, <clears throat> the basis for processing all of these, is very different. The skills you'll need, <coughs> the extent to which the people look like Unix gurus and still have sandals and ponytails. It's totally different between these two environments. Unstructured is harder. It may be more valuable. This, this one, again, is before engaging the consultants. Decide what you want to do with the data and how timely you want things to be. Most companies are building what they call had data ponds. Now, we now talk to AT&T and other people. They have data lakes, huge <coughs> sets of Hadoop cluster with large amounts of data inside it. And a lot of their big data processing is fishing that lake. Ask a question and trawl through it, trying to find answers. And this is the ideal starting point for some people with big data. Keep everything you want. Don't know the questions to ask, trawl through it. The more sophisticated people are now filtering the pipe as information that goes into the lake. This is what people are doing with share trading. This is what people are doing to generate timely alerts with traffic systems. Uh, this is what some people are even planning to do with some medical data, is look at the changes daily. So rather than filter the lake, <coughs> you actually, sorry, rather than fish the lake, you filter the pipe. Typically, you start trying something out with the process <laughs> above. And then people are now looking to move to that process below. <coughs> Do you plan to combine your data? This actually has turned out to be a huge challenge. And uh, I've been involved in a charity, I'll tell you about later, joining bits of government data together. Um, you can have the perfect island of data. But if you can't join it to someone else's data, you can't realize its full value. Design up front those magic pieces of information that allow you to cluster those two sets of information together. And it could be that it's a very basic thing that catches you out. I list a whole set of keys together which allow you to pull information together. But it might be something as simple as gender. There's one government database that says male and female I worked with. Another one says male, female, not known, or deliberately didn't declare. Now, that's a problem if you're just going to join two sets of data together of the simplest kind. <coughs> In practice, there are lots of other things. What are the keys that allow you to generate your data and loosely couple it with other things? Uh, just an aside here, some of the most interesting companies coming out of big data at the moment are looking to aggregate all of that information about each of you. Only probably a few kilobytes of data, but averaging, bringing together each of your individual identities. Uh, sixth point is can you leverage free data? Leverage? Leverage? I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong country. There are a lot of open data sources. Ordnance Survey have a great set of open data. Transport for London, there are APIs if you want to find out where trains are moving, or their buses and sort of the things. HESA published a whole set of educational data as three just samples. And I'm going to have to read the number off my slides because I looked last night. Yes, on the government database, there are some 14,000 published data sets. And intriguingly, recently, they now tell you about the 4,000 data sets that they don't publish, but they at least tell you they exist. If you're interested in data as well, I'd encourage you to look at the Guardian data blog. Um, some of the items are interesting, though recently it's been very much focused on education information. Do you need to process and retain personal information? This could be a session all on its own. And I've got a lot more slides on that if some of you want to send me an email afterwards and I can give you them. But there is a whole different ball game once you're dealing with personally identifiable information in terms of legislative processes, in terms of people's <coughs> rights to get to the data, people's rights to ask for the data to be deleted, and commercial risks. And one thing I'd ask you to remember out of this, there's a lot of discussion about anonymizing data, and the NHS have done it. As a technician, from my point of view, the only form of data which is truly anonymous is the data which is aggregated across a number of individuals, typically five or more. 
The last one is, uh, I couldn't, is basically invest in visualizing the data. Um, I couldn't actually find a good example of some nice commercial data, so I thought I'd come up with rather a nice cartoon here. Uh, Lord of the Rings. I always thought it was that complicated when I had to read it at school. Um, and of course, Star Wars will double in length soon. Um, basically, invest in visualization. This is probably the biggest technical learning we had. We had lots of geeks. We looked at all the Hadoop from various other things. We landed up with lots of data and tables. And we went, how are we going to show this to the CEO? How do we make this visual? How do we actually have the things that we do not only visualize data, but you can explore it? I'm going to come up with some ideas for you. What I do, I do a short pitch. Uh, I work on geolocation for the mobile phone companies working out where people are inside the cells with GPS turned off. So we can tell where all the people are all of the time and what they're doing. Uh, that data is kept inside the carriers, but we're talking to carriers as to how they can publish aggregated data of where they were, maybe where they were shopping and this kind of thing. Because of the privacy issues, we do not work for some of this stuff, the big data analysis, with individual data. We're only looking at solutions dealing with aggregated data. Last couple of slides. Thank you. I'm going to invite you to be disruptive. And I thought of a series of things. So what I'm going to invite you to do is think of applications during the day where you could put big data on a phone for people to use. Go to the far extreme. Say, how do you boil your big data down and make something useful maybe on a handset rather than some sort of website or anything else? And think about a few things. Yeah. What happens when you have big data sets in your hand? Maybe it's in the police's hand or in some authority's hand, not always your own hand, but yeah. talking to British Rail, what happened if they knew about every item of their plant on their track site in a mobile app? <coughs> I've just been waved for five minutes. What happens if well, the police... Zero. Sorry? <laughs> Less than five. Okay, this is the last slide. What happens if the police know the registration and tax status of every car in the UK? Actually, I think they might already have that. <laughs> what happens if you know the batch number of every drug and the serial number of it and whether it claims to have been used and you just bought some drugs on the internet? Maybe you'll check something. And some bankers said, well, actually, we've been trying with having a database of the serial number of every single paper note in this country uh, for detecting people who happen to have it of printing their own money. And what are the unexpected consequences? Hmm. So I'm going to end here with two examples of two applications, neither of which I think you've heard of, but actually I'm not sure I'd leave home without them. So I'm with big data sets in your pocket. The first one I have nothing to do with, apart from I have a few friends there. It's from Experian, it's 300 megabytes, and it's got data about every single postcode in the UK and in terms of social class, the sort of people who are there, the house prices, everything else. I wouldn't buy a house without that app. The second one I have to claim I'm involved in uh, in my evenings as a charity. It tells kids which courses they should go, which A-levels they should study, and which careers they should go into. And it's the only one that actually will tell you if you actually have an interest in the career, what degree you should do, help you pick where you should go, and uh, then tell you that people in that course, what A-levels they actually entered the course with and which grades, which makes those old university publications you look like look rather weak. Uh, by the way, if any of you have kids about to go to university, I've got some cards advertising this one as you go out. Uh, so, I guess it's thank you. And as I said, uh, what is big data? It's really whatever you want it to be, because that's, big data is a marketing man's paradise for saying we can do good things. But the basic thing is, you've got all this data, you have to find the questions to ask of it, you have to find a way of reducing it to actionable information, and you have to be aware of the consequences of what you're doing. Thank you very much indeed. Enjoy the rest of your day. So thank you. Um, I'm sure you'll agree that was an extremely thought-provoking and interesting um, introduction to the day, and I hope we'll have opportunities to follow up on, on many of those themes. Um, I'd like now to introduce the next speaker, thank you, uh, who is uh, Adrian Conduit. Uh, Adrian is Director of Healthcare, 
with Hitachi Consulting UK. Uh, after spending many years in the National Health Service, he's now um, working in their European Big Data Laboratory, uh, which is close by here in Manchester. Adrian? Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much for the opening statements. I wish I'd seen his presentation before I did mine, because mine would be much more cuddly than it's going to be. And I'd also like to admit at this point, I'd like to be an engineer so I could take my tie off. Um, I'm going to talk in generalities about some of the stuff that uh, we're doing in big data and then unashamedly as a healthcare professional dive down to some case studies about what we're doing in partnership in Manchester with the Manchester Academic Health Science Network, something which I hope you'll hear more about and actually will be of direct relevance to people in the country, which as Phil was saying, the whole thing about big data is making it useful. It can't be a thing in itself, it's got to be something that, that, that is, is used. Um, we're doing a lot of stuff in these things, um, and we have a number of laboratories around, around Europe. Um, Hitachi makes a big investment in, in R&D, um, has five laboratories in, in Japan, and currently has 10 operatives in Manchester who've been outsourced from Tokyo to come and work on the big data projects that we've got going in Manchester. And I will focus very much on the UK. This is just to show we are a big company and we work in different countries. But the stuff that's going on in the UK, I think, it, it will be of interest. And the stuff, stuff in Europe, particularly with some of the breakout uh, sessions on transportation stuff, I think are worth mentioning. But I will stick at a very high level because I'm not skilled in the detail. Um, so we're doing stuff on automotive. Um, and I think the, the key to all of this is just to see just how integrated these things can be and how people are using diff bringing different sets of technologies together to try and provide cities, particularly cities, with infrastructure that, that works for their people. Um, and the stuff that's going on with cars, the stuff that's going with smart monitoring, the stuff that's going and looking about how, how social innovation comes together and creates an environment for citizens to access information and make it work for them. I think uh, uh, we're at, at an, exci an exciting time. Um, we know that things are changing within the demographics of the population. Uh, we're all living generally longer lives, healthier lives, I'm speaking particularly in the, in the sort of Western societies. Um, we're all living longer lives with diseases. Um, we spend, as a, as, as a society, something in excess of 65% of our total spend on healthcare, not on the ambulances rushing into hospitals, but on the chronic conditions that most of us live with. And as most people in the room will know, by the middle of this century, 25% of the population in, the, in Europe will be over 65. In Japan, it's over 40%. Those are going to have significant impacts on the kind of services we need to look after us and maintain us in, in, in our increasing age, but with increasing levels of infirmity. Um, what we're trying to use um, the Manchester work for and the, and the use of data is to look at how you create different models of treatment and how you gather information on people's care and use it to promote and improve the health care that they get. Um, this curve here, the, the red line is where we spend money at the moment. We tend to spend it mainly in the, the curative bit. And the blue line is where the model that's being developed in Manchester is trying to move the paradigm to saying, let's do some more about monitoring and improving and use sensors and data to look at people. If you think about what we do all the time, and what Phil was saying earlier, we gather information on what we do the whole time. We have relied, I think, on our institutions to gather information on us. And as anybody who's been to a hospital in the UK will know, how many times do you get asked who you are and where you live? If you get asked it more than once, you begin to wonder whether the person asking you knows the hell what they're doing professionally, let alone if they know who you are. Um, so about the gathering around of data and the monitoring of healthcare, it's about putting it back in the hands, I think, of the people whose care it is, us, and using the sensors and things that are around us in everyday life. I mean, there are 150 apps now that uh, you can use on devices that will send information to something like a Health Faults account so that when you stand on your scales in the morning, whether you like it or not, your account will know how heavy you are. So all these things can be used to look at how you, you modify and change your healthcare. Um, we're trying to move this model in Manchester away from purely institutional, institutional care and more into the pre-medical phase. And what I want to talk about are two particular things that we're doing in Manchester. One is the techie thing the secure data, the bringing together of all the data sources with an electronic secure handshake 
so that the data can be available to a clinician to see everything about you that's relevant for your care, with your permission. The data governance around this is always the, the, the thorny issue. Um, but it doesn't require, and it picked, I think the, the lake pipe thing is an interesting one, because in the old days, we would have said, right, what we need to do is create a Hitachi database, which would also be vendor neutral, with open source. We're going to put this box here. I'm going to chuck all this stuff into this box so you know where it is. The new system is this stuff already exists, so let's just find a way of shaking hands with it so that it brings together a view of the patient that's relevant to the clinician at that time. And when you don't want it, it goes back to where it was. So we don't need to create a new set of boxes. We need to think laterally about how to use the information that's already there and make sure that it's patent, that we have permission to use it. And once we don't need it for the purpose we've created it, stick with the Colicott view and let it go back to where it was. Um, that's the technology bit. Now the, the really interesting bit is what are we going to do with it in terms of treatment? Um, you may or may not know that we're on the cusp of an explosion of diabetes. Not if you know, shake your head if you've never heard about it. Um, one borough in London last October, 10% of its population were type 2 diabetics. If you look at the impact of diabetes, uh, the LSE did a paper last year, I think it was, the cost of diabetes in this country, if you think our spend is about 130, 140 billion, just shy of 30 billion pounds of direct and indirect costs due to diabetes. There's a new diabetic in, in America every 17 seconds. Um, if you look at all of the stuff about obesity and lifestyle change, um, it's, it's going to be a big, a big consumer of resource. But more importantly, it's the impact on the individual. Their social mobility, their economic activity, everything starts to become a bad story once you tip over. We have a, a program which has been working in a non-technological way, which has been working in Japan in the five hospitals that Hitachi owns and runs, of gathering up the people who look like they're at risk, the pre-diabetics, and putting them through a program. And the results over a 10-year period is seven, just over 70% of the people who go on the program do not become type 2 diabetics. They do not become sick. You manage them from being sick. So the program in, in, in Manchester is about identifying, working, and using a combination of technology, data, and straightforward human interaction to help this group of people not become ill. And if you look at this model, this model can be applied to any other kind of chronic condition. So we're not just talking about diabetes, we're talking about heart-related, vascular diseases, liver diseases, which is going to be the next one that, that catches us if you look at the alcohol consumption in this country and the number of uh, new liver disease patients we're getting. But all of this is about bringing together the combination of a technological platform that allows you to access interaction with the patient, the patient putting information, their data, into a system and monitoring their progress with the assistance of professionals and, uh, and interactions and, and uh, a coaching model, but to actually take that information, use the platform to help prevent disease, because it's a hell of a lot easier to, to keep someone well than it is to cure them because the, long, the whole point about long-term conditions is they're not curable. You just ameliorate the, uh, the impact. And uh, if anybody, and I hold my hand up as someone with a chronic condition that I will never, never get rid of during my lifetime, the amelioration of these conditions requires the use of drugs, maybe some other therapies, has an impact on your life. So if you can avoid them or manage them at the much milder end, both the individual and society uh, will, will benefit because it has a direct impact on us and shows how you can bring data together, because one of the slides that Phil showed was a Tesco club card. Um, I know we're being filmed and therefore we need to be careful about what one says. We should say, wouldn't it be interesting if you could put the club card purchasing data alongside someone you're trying to manage and help them manage their lifestyle, and you look about what they're buying or what they say they have for breakfast? Because part of this program, actually you have to point and shoot to say, how big a breakfast do you have? And what do you have? And the patient says, well, that. And then you give them a, a, a goal of how to reduce the size of their breakfast. You engage a sort of social contract. But if you had a whole list of, so you bought all of these interesting things here, but you say you've eaten vegetable and fruit, um, <laughs> you do then start to get into using data to help modify what people say, not just, just use it as a, a big slab. And, and the thing about the pipe and the lake, I think, is interesting, because I agree with you entirely, and I think it should be a theme for the day, that I've been intrigued as a non-data professional to look at data that gives you an answer. But the 
obverse of that is this mass of data now that should start to stimulate in your, our minds new questions, and I can give you a real example. We have a much cleverer version of the, fit, the Nike Fit Band called the Hitachi Life Microscope, which, which no one will ever see, because Nike have flooded the market with their less good one. But it's an XY accelerometer, and it produces a thing called a tapestry diagram. Every day you get one line. We developed it for our employees going back to work after long-term sick to see if they were well. And we were judging what well looked like by regular sleep patterns. So, it, hi. So, so that if, if someone had a regular sleep pattern, we thought they were looking OK. And so, so you're looking for this lab. And you get l different levels of activity, red, blue, whatever. And so we're looking at these tapestry diagrams. And a, a researcher said, look at this. And I said, well, what's that? And we had odd blips in certain places. And we then started to do new analysis to try and find out what the odd things were. And some of them were completely spurious. They were just odd recordings. But then we started to find there were clusters. And the clusters were about geography. And the geography related to something else. And you start finding that the data provides you with the opportunity to ask new, better questions. And other than this last one, which I'd like to say, we've opened a new lab in Denmark because we're going to do a smart city thing of combining all the data there around what you can do with cities and how you can make them more energy efficient, more good places to live. Um, I think I really want to leave you now with just the thought that big data, as a, as a, as a scientist in, involved in what was the, in the healthcare, I, I loved blood, but I'm allowed out during the daylight. Um, <laughs> I think we're at a, a great time of using the data. I think the problem, one of the things we have with big data, is it's going to raise lots of specters about information governance. I think the care.data debacle has, has not helped us at all in terms of how we handle health data. As data professionals, I think we have a, a role in making sure that the public gets simpler messages rather than too complex messages. And I would just like to leave you with the message of hoping you all have a really good day. I've been really pleased to be able to speak to you this morning. But if you do hear about things going on in the healthcare environment, it's about doing simple things for people early using data as the facilitator. Thank you very Thank much. You. So again, uh, outstanding and thought-provoking. Thank you very much. Um, we now squeeze in uh, our last speaker, who is Glyn Powditch. Glyn is the CTO and co-founder of Dream Agility, and he's been working on big data as it applies to small uh, SME scale companies. So, Glyn, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? <coughs> yeah, fantastic. Yeah, great lines. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to, I've got very little time, so I'm going to crack through it. So, um, 12 months to the opening of the biggest big data door in history for SMEs. Uh, so, what am I talking about? So, essentially, Google uh, right now are doing some incredible trials in the US right now. So, what they're doing, these, uh, this is a typical Google search result when you're searching for a product. And what you're essentially seeing is Google is starting to favor <laughs> above all else, location. So when you're searching for a specific product, quite often Google's been really good at showing you online aggregators that will probably deliver you in a, a product in about three to five days' time. And what we, we typically see is around sort of the Christmas period, many retailers, about the 14th, 15th of December, uh, customers get, start getting quite nervous because obviously you want presents to be there for loved ones and so on, and online aggregators don't really do it. So click and collect really starts to, to fly at that point. Many retailers, we see sales of sort of 30 to 40% of the actual annual year comes in that Christmas period. So location is absolutely critical. And what Google are now starting to do in these, in these tests is they're basically serving local stores and actually saying, this item that you're searching for, how, how far actually is it physically from you based upon your location? Can you go and pick it up today? Uh, so to really labor the point, I had to do a presentation at uh, Desborough a few weeks back and we discovered the day before we needed an HDMI cable for a Mac. Now, you couldn't believe how difficult it is online to go and locate one of these at short notice. That's where you can buy computers. No, it's not. <laughs> so so you, you end up, in the end, going through to a call center in a, a PC world, nowhere near the store that you're actually in. They don't know what stock's actually there at all, and it's just a nightmare. In the end, you have to basically walk into the store and buy. So this is absolutely incredible. This is the first time where Google are actually uh, doing e-commerce in a way in which actually favours 
the, the small independents and, and the location-based retailers above the aggregators. So it's absolutely massive. You don't even actually need, you can see here they're serving the ad, they actually provide you with a storefront. You don't even need a website here. You, could, you can basically process the payments through Google Wallet, but it, it's basically allowing uh, retailers to really target based on location like never before. So I'm, I'm immensely excited about this, as you can probably tell. However, there's, there's a, having worked with a lot of SMEs wanting to, to actually get their stock online in the first place to take advantage of this, and as I say, they're trying it in the US now, so I, I would expect, based upon Google's previous behavior, we'll, we'll be seeing this within the next 12 months. The big challenge they've got is actually getting their data in order. So it's so at this point about basic structured data. It's incredible how many uh, SMEs and retailers generally don't have any kind of inventory uh, feed at all. They can't put their inventory or haven't put their inventory into an Excel file. And when you then start talking to major name suppliers, household names, so I won't mention them, uh, they, they quite often supply you with uh, thousands of lines of, of SKUs, individual items, of, with the images in one file and the, the titles, the descriptions, and the model numbers in the other. And they basically expect you to know which SKU image matches to which piece of data. So they're not helping things. But, but fundamentally, if, uh, if if small retailers can basically get their, their stock into basic order uh, and then start feeding it into Google, they've actually, for the first time ever, got every opportunity to, to really compete and, and use Google to its best advantage. The other brilliant thing is once they've done this, they can then start plugging quite easily into Amazon, Facebook, Yahoo, all these other marketplaces as well. So not only can you start really targeting click and collect, but you can also start really distributing your products you know, globally in a way like never before using all of these sort of big data marketplaces. Make sure I press this the right way. So some really simple uh, tools, big data tools for actually getting in the game. All of these uh, are pretty much free. Um, Google Analytics is just absolutely incredible. If you, you looked at what it would, would cost to buy an equivalent solution, you're looking at a minimum of about £30,000, but Google give it to you for free. Um, AdWords, Google AdWords, uh, incredible in terms of things like market share data. You can see um, you know, what, what, who, who's basically looking at your website, uh, who's looking at your business, who else are they looking at as well. Facebook Insights, incredible uh, data for targeting and actually showing you who your customer is. But many years ago, you, you'd go to a marketing agency, they'd look at all the postcodes on your database, and they'd go and do all this CRM, and it cost you an absolute fortune, then they'd tie it into Mosaic and, and tell you sort of certain profiles about it. Now, with Facebook Insights, you can pretty much get a lot of that data for free. Um, and we, we, it's amazing, we were um, at a conference the other day, and a, a butcher in Berry uh, with market stores, using Facebook just in an incredible way. Uh, 630,000 views he had on one particular post. He's now uh, doing deliveries 24-7. He understands his customers intimately because of Facebook insights. So mm -hmm. incredible stuff. <coughs> Final slide, because I've absolutely <coughs> battered through this. I'm, uh, I've only got about three to five minutes. One of the big things that uh, come out is that there's a chap um, I know who runs a very successful uh, venture capital uh, company focusing in technology, ex-Goldman Sachs, and he said that the biggest uh, challenge most companies have got, and it's been alluded to today, is around actually the insights and, and getting somebody to actually look at the data. So the data's there, but getting, getting smart people on it. And there's literally just, the, the universities are sat on millions, of, I mean, I'm talking individual universities, sat on millions of pounds, often of funding that's available to get really smart PhD level guys looking at data. So in my company at the moment, we've had six MBAs uh, working for us for the past six weeks for the grand sum of 500 pounds. <laughs> it's just incredible. The biggest challenge, I think, actually, so I, I disagree with him that, that actually the issue is getting at the data. Actually, no, you can get people to get at the data. It's getting at the universities to get the funding. Um, you can, we've had part, uh, examples of partnerships where we had a PhD mathematician <coughs> work uh, for a business I was in for a year, cost us 12,000 pounds. The level of value that they added was just incredible. Uh, SEIS is another one as well where basically uh, companies can, if, if you've got a, a really good idea, come together, uh, technology companies coming together with traditional retailers. We've done one ourselves with some traditional jewelers. Uh, SEIS means that investors can effectively claim uh, back up to 78% of their investment uh, against tax. So 
it's almost a, almost a free lunch and he wants to give the tax man the money anyway. Um, so there's some great opportunities there. As I say, KTP and Accelerator Funds, I know of uh, a couple of local technology companies who've uh, raised anywhere between sort of 200 and 350,000 pound in match funding. Uh, so so let's, let's use these universities. It's amazing how many companies will target these, these graduates and pay them an absolute fortune uh, when they want to come and work for them. And yet if they want to effectively stay in education but still work at your site, you can pay them massively less uh, and get all of the analysis done all the same. Uh, so that's it. Uh, any questions, just uh, nab me a break. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, I hope those three presentations have uh, helped inspire and set the scene. Let me now explain a little bit about what happens for the rest of the day. First of all, we have a coffee break. The coffee break will be 15 minutes if I speak very, very quickly. Uh, it is in the atrium. The atrium is upstairs from the main reception area where you came in off the roundabout. So it's back out that way. Uh, the, uh, coffee break will be followed by four parallel breakout sessions, and you can find the details in your, in your book. Uh, briefly, uh, these will cover connected car and automotive services, so that will be in the Walton Room A, which is in the Cockroft Institute on the other side of the roundabout where you came in. Digital Society and the Connected Consumer, that will be back here in this lecture theater. The Internet of Things and Smart Networks, and that will be in the Thompson Suite. And the power of big data in improving population health, so healthcare applications, that will be in the Walton Room B. So those breakout sessions will run in parallel, and I hope you can find at least one that's interesting to you. Uh, they will end at 12 o'clock, where there will be a networking lunch back in the atrium, which is the place we're going to go to now for coffee. After lunch, we have a session uh, hosted by the Hartree Center and the uh, Virtual Engineering Center looking at data to deliver new insights and deliver better products. So um, industrial applications of simulation and high performance computing uh, with presentations from our partners in IBM and Unilever. And after that at 2.15, there will be the opportunity if you can stay uh, to tour some of the science facilities here on site. Um, so I'd like Finally, uh, just to thank our partners in, in organizing all of this, um, UKTI, obviously, but also the partners whose logos have been shown there who are helping to organize and chair the breakout sessions, the Knowledge Transfer Network, Tech UK, uh, and our, our partners, as I said, in Hartree and, and the Virtual Engineering Center. I'd like to th thank the three speakers once again for their inspirational and outstanding presentations, and I'd like to thank all of you once again for joining us here today at Darsbury. So please, one more round of applause for the speakers, and then coffee.